Order to Phoenix. And now we are in Half-Blood Prince. So I want to start. <clears throat> Notice the first chapter. The other minister. Who is it? The Prime Minister. The Muggle Minister. Is it the Prime Minister? No. no. Or is it the uh, Minister for Magic? The minister. Because it's what it, the Prime Minister calls the Minister. Oh, we're talking about the Prime Minister. It's what the Prime Minister calls the other minister. Okay. So we open and Fudge shows up. This is, uh, I've got to do the calculations in my mind because I'm using the British edition. Um, around uh, page three or four, Fudge shows up and he says, difficult word to begin. Okay. Fiddling with his bowler hat. What a week, what a week. You've had a bad one too, huh? The Prime Minister says, Fudge, of course. Been having the same week you have, Prime Minister. Brockdale Bridge. Notice, it's not the Millennium Bridge, like in the film. Brockdale Bridge, the Bones and Vance murders, not to mention the ruckus in the West Country. Now, we don't know who the Bones and Vance murders are at this point, do we? If we recognize the name Bones, then. We recognize the name Bones, okay. Um, or have they already been... That's the bridge. That's the West Country. Yeah, they've not been named prior to this in terms of the um, murders. Susan Bones, former, not Susan Bones. Amelia. Emily Vance. Um, yeah, Amelia. Um, former, what was her position in book five? Magical law enforcement. She was the one who was so impressed by Harry doing the corporeous, uh, the Patronus charm, producing a corporeal uh, Patronus. Okay, Emily Vance, we know from what? Okay, I'll leave that one. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, you are your. I mean, to say some of your people were involved in those those <coughs> things, were they? Of course they were. Surely you've realized what's going on. Uh, and then we get a long description of the Prime Minister's previous interactions with Fudge over the last several years. Okay. So we come down to around page 10 or so. Um, yeah. And the Prime Minister says, so it's your fault those people were killed, and I'm having to answer questions about rusted rigging and corroded expansion joints, and I don't know what else. Fudge, my fault? You saying I should have caved in to blackmail? Well, maybe not. Okay. Talks about the hurricanes. Fudge, wasn't a hurricane. Giants. What? Death Eaters, who must not be named followers. We expect giant involvement. What? Okay. They mentioned the deaths. Then losing Amelia Bones. Who? Amelia Bones, head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. We think he must not be named. May have murdered her in person. She was a very gifted witch, and all the evidence was that she put up a real fight. But that murder was in the newspapers. Middle-aged woman lived alone. Nasty killing. Rather a lot of publicity. People are baffled. Well, of course they are. Killed in a room that was locked from the inside, wasn't she? We, on the other hand, know exactly who did it. Not that that gets us any further towards catching him. Why is it so important that this was a murder in a locked room? Because it was in the muggle world, so how would that have... Yeah, I, that have yeah how did, but when you can apparate and disapparate, locked doors don't mean anything. Okay? Emily Vance, maybe you heard about... Yeah, I did. Around the corner from here, in fact. Papers for Adam Field Day with that. Okay? What is... Fudge's point with the minister. What's he trying to get the minister to see? Or what does he get the minister to see? That the magical world is coming in conflict. Non They're above. Is it that it's coming in conflict? <sighs> or that they coexist? They coexist. Yeah. Or, another way of putting it, 
What is happening in the magical world is bleeding into the physical world. Notice my term for our world, the physical world. It's almost like the magical world is the spiritual world. Okay, Because after all, what else is happening in London? And it's causing what? It's causing unnatural mist or fog. See, I mean, you have the, we even have a, a maker of clothing called London Fog. But that name is anachronistic. That name dates from, the term London Fog refers to the kind of smog and pollution London had in the 19th century as a result of the Industrial Revolution and all the coal being pushed into the atmosphere. So that when you would get a natural fog, it would combine with the pollution and be so thick that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Okay? And it was that way up through the 1950s. But beginning in the 1960s, various clean air acts, etc., London, London doesn't have, generally as a city, a pollution problem. Okay? Uh, it's not like L.A. I've been to London a number of times. I've been to L.A. once. I'd never go back to L.A. I'd go back to London in a heartbeat. Okay? Or even where I grew up in, in San Jose, California. Where if you drive from the Bay Area, if you drive from Santa Clara Valley, Silicon Valley, Apple headquarters, and drive up to the top of the Santa Cruz Mountains, on a normal day in the summer, you will rise through the smog line. And you get up and above that, and you look down over the valley, and it is brown. And you don't see the buildings. You just see a brown, hazy layer. Or... You did 30 years ago when I lived there. It's probably not that way now. Okay? Yeah, they passed a, yeah, pass a lot of clean air laws and all that kind of stuff. The point is, you know, even there, you've got kind of two different levels of reality. Well, you, same thing applies here. Okay? These things that are happening in Harry's world have what? An effect on the real world or corresponding actions in the real world. Where do we see that beginning in the Harry Potter series? First novel. We're introduced to the idea when Harry gets on the train and meets Ron. He buys his chocolate frog cards. Who's the first chocolate frog card he reads about? Dumbledore. Albus Dumbledore, who what? Defeated Grindelwald. When? In 1945. Why 1945? Why not 1931? World War, II. World War II. Who was defeated in World War II? Hitler was. Hitler is the physical, our world, manifestation of the evil of Grindelwald. How do we know? Because they had the exact same ideologies. Which is the exact same ideology that Voldemort has. That we will see Voldemort put into practice when... Next book, he's in power, and we see the new statue in the Ministry of Magic. And they go in, Harry, uh, Ron, and Hermione in their... Uh, Polyjuice. Yeah, yeah. yeah Polyjuice uh, disguises, okay? And they see what? Magic is might. What does that mean? That means might makes right. That's what that means, okay? That is Nietzschean. Friedrich Nietzsche, philosopher, founder of, of uh, nihilism. Okay. So, chapter two. So, this book is opening how? Notice, it's not number four, Private Drive, first of all. This is what Harry is expecting to happen at the beginning of book five. Mysterious murders, unnatural events, bridges falling apart, Okay? Chaos everywhere. And notice what Fudge tells him. Uh, we're not in control anymore. And he gets introduced to, you know, um, Rufus Scrimger and such. Okay, chapter two, Spinner's End. I've got to move this for a moment because I've got to get over the board. I should have locked those things. So... Spinner's End. What the 
does spinner's end refer to? It's the street where Snape lives, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is Snape's street. Okay, what else does it refer to? Two words you have to define. Spinner in in. Okay, spinner in. What things spin? Tops, wheels, what else? Cogs. Cogs. Cogs, wheels. World. Spider. Spiders. Spiders spin webs. We've already seen spiders introduced. Okay. It's one of the clues Harry has to figure out in the third test. Okay. In. What does in mean? Final. Okay. What else does it mean? You've heard of the phrase ends in means or means to an end? Yeah. What's end mean there? Result. Result. Destination. Destination. Okay. Each of these have another idea embedded in them that this one is close to if you reverse that means to an end. It's purpose. Like, the end of this is not this part. The end of this is what? It's remote, right? It remotes something. It operates something remotely. In this case, that. Okay? The end of this is what? Whiteboard marker. It's to write on a board. Okay? The end of these is to see more clearly the darkened outside. It's its purpose. It's what it's made for. This really would not work very well if I tried to stick it in my ignition in my car. Why? It's not its purpose. Okay? So, now start to put them all together. Spinners in. Uh, one other thing. What else are spinners? Okay, spiders we talked about. Think mythology. You may not be very... Familiar. The, the fates. The three fates in Greek mythology. Atropo, Lachesis. It happens every time. And I don't think I have the note written down in my book. And Clotho. Three sisters, okay? Those the ones in Hercules that cut the string. Yep. yep. Atropos is the one who cuts. Because atropos is to like diminish. Right. One of them, and I can't remember which, one of them is the weaver, and one is the measurer of the threads of your life. Okay? So one spins out the thread of your life. The other one says... You live this long, and somebody else lives this long, and somebody else lives this long, and Atropo takes the scissors, okay? So all that. Now, go from all that to spinners in. What's happening in this chapter? Okay, are we sure? Hold on, before I say anything else about that, has anybody not read book seven yet? One. Okay. I know. I know. <laughs> okay, we won't talk about it then. Oh, man. It's fine. We can. Okay, Bellatrix is questioning Snape's loyalty. Why are Bellatrix and Arsis at Snape's house? How? How? The unbreakable vow. Okay. The unbreakable vow is the spinning. That's the web that is being spun. What happens with spiders' webs? What do they do? What is their purpose? To catch things. 
Okay. What is the end of the things that are caught? They're dead. They're dead. <laughs> That's what happens. Yeah, they become food. Okay. Um, without giving, mm, wow, because no. I don't want to give it away. Uh, so there's a lot of there's a there's a lot of different webs being spun here. Okay, who thinks? Who's the unbreakable vowel between? Snape and Narcissa. Who is weaving that web? Narcissa is. She's the she's the spider making the web. What is she attempting to do? Catch Snape. How? Is is that what she's really interested in? She's trying to protect Draco. Okay. Bellatrix is really the one. She's the Black Widow in the corner, you know. Okay. So she's trying to protect her son. How? What's the vow that he makes? He will do the deed Malfoy's tasked to do if Malfoy can't. Yeah, and to protect him from harm. Okay. So that's that's all the web. There is a without going into detail. There is a much bigger web, however, being spun that we don't find out in this book at all. We don't find it out until the end of the next book, without giving the away anything. The the web is, is kind of more shown in the movie itself because it's it's like a band that wraps around them rather than the shots of flames, red flames that come out. Of them. Bear in mind, what kind of magic is this? It's not dark. Not dark magic. No. Is it easy or advanced? advanced. It's advanced. Well, George tried to do it to Ron or something. So. When Ron was five. <sighs> How? <laughs> yeah, don't, don't worry about that. It's sort of okay. one of those things where it probably wouldn't work anyway, but the kind of the idea of them trying to do that. Um, Molly came in and caught them. I think it was Molly. Came in and caught them, and uh, Ron says, you know, something, one of the brothers, you know, left cheek hasn't been the same since then because he got spanked so hard. Okay. I mean, so that kind of implies uh, it could have been dangerous. Okay. Because what happens, obviously, an unbreakable vow. If you break it, you die. Um, is it this one? Yeah. Okay. Because it's whenever uh, they're telling Harry. Or yeah, he asks about the unbreakable vow. Yeah. That's right. And Ron, ex Ron explains it. Yeah, because he hears Snape. He overhears Snape talking. Yeah, much, much later yeah. in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he asks because he he's never heard about it. Hermione knows because she, <coughs> she read all the books and stuff. Okay. Um, Describe Spinner's in the street. Okay, it's a Muggle neighborhood. Sounds kind of suburby. Suburby? What are, what are we literally told is on the street? As you walk down the street and you make your way to Snape's house, which is at the end of the street, we're told of a building on one side. It is an old boarded-up factory. So where does Snape live? In Not in a leafy Tony Brentwood. Poor neighborhood. Poor neighborhood. He lives in Youngstown, Ohio, or you know, somewhere in, in Pennsylvania. Okay? But in England. Because they have their Youngstowns in Erie, Pennsylvania, etc. Because they had the steel industry and everything before we did. <laughs> okay, that's that's where Snape grows up. Why is that important? Okay, book seven without naming names. 
we discover in book seven, Snape grows up in the same area as somebody else because they're childhood friends. That tells us that other person is not necessarily, I mean, again, is not from the same city, or excuse me, not from the same street, but is from the same area. That person does not come from an upper middle class background. Who does more or less come from an upper middle class background? James? James. Harry? The Dursleys aren't poor by any means. They're not your average middle class either. Vernon Dursley does what for a living? He sells drills. It's not just that he sells drills. He's the manager of a drill company. He's not the owner. He's the manager. He is what would be called upper level management. This would be upper middle class. He's, he's making, well, not probably CEO, Beneath that, you know, chief of operations kind of a thing, rather than chief executive officer, okay? He's the one who makes sure all the machines and everything are running, all the orders are being fulfilled, et cetera, et cetera. So he's not doing poorly. After all, he says in, what is it, book two, if they get that deal, they'll be able to what? Not move to Spain, buy a second house. In Mallorca, okay. this is plush vacation digs. This isn't like, you know, a one-bedroom cabin in the woods. This is not the hut on the rock in the sea kind of a thing. Okay. This is this is nice place. Watch, you know, House Hunters International, some every now and then HGTV, and you'll they'll they'll do things for Mallorca every now and then. These are not shoddy places, okay? So you've got all this going on. Who's living there other than Snape? Wormtail. Okay. So what goes on, real briefly, between Snape and Bellatrix? What does Snape have to show slash prove to Bellatrix? That's loyalty. Okay. His loyalty. Why he didn't come to the aid of Voldemort, etc.? The, 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 the fact that Voldemort trusts him. What what does he kind of keep pushing back into her face? He knows if, plan. if he's such a great uh, wizard, then why would he still continue to talk to Snape if he didn't have some reason to believe there was loyalty? Okay. There? He keeps saying, like, <coughs> Maybe he doesn't, maybe Voldemort doesn't trust you with anything. Maybe he doesn't, mm, yeah. you know, have, maybe he just won't. Maybe he hasn't filled you in on the plan. Yeah. Like he has me. Like, do you, do you really think that I could outsmart Voldemort? Like, and do you think that you're worthy of that information? So he then takes that and turns that against her by saying what? Well, maybe we should talk about this with the Dark Lord. And she's like, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. He mentions, yeah, legilimency or legilimency, okay? So, they do the vow, okay? And as I said, as we said, the vow means if you break the vow, what happens? You die. We're going to see another unbreakable vow. That's not this kind of unbreakable vow. Anybody know where it is? Up top of your head? Louder. The wedding. The wedding. We hear that it is an unbreakable vow. But it's not one done with the wands and the bands around the arm and, you know, ball and chain, you know, kind of thing. Okay? Chapter 3, Will and Won't. Now we get to Harry. Okay? Usually in the other books, when we haven't begun at number 4, Privet Drive, where do we go there? Second chapter. So we take a little bit longer this time. And we finally get there, and what do we read? Harry Potter, the Chosen One. And we see the article, and we read about Scrimger succeeding Fudge. Kind of like, you know, finally, somebody, you know, hopefully they might, might do a little bit better job. No. Ministry guarantees student safety. Okay, kind of sounds like Parkland, Florida all over again. 
And then page 45, we read the guidelines for protecting your home and family against dark forces. The pamphlet. Don't leave house alone. Particular care should be taken during the hours of darkness. Review the security arrangements. Agree security questions with close friends and family. What what are these security questions? Questions that only one other person would know kind of a thing. So we're going to see that. We see... Um, yeah, we see Arthur do it in the, in the next book. We see, however, in this book, even earlier, we see Dumbledore, we see Lupin, etc. Okay. Kind of interesting, this book came out in 2005. Yeah, 2005. Most of you were probably too young at the time, but after 2000, after 9-11, our government literally produced a pamphlet kind of like this about, you know, if you see something, say something, as well as, you know, everybody who has a home or apartment should have rolls of plastic sheeting and duct tape so that you can, if you see a flash, a tunnel bomb, duct tape with plastic your windows to keep the radiation out. Yeah. Literally. Okay. I grew up uh, in the 60s, went to school in the 60s when we had duck and cover drills. Where I grew up was not even 20 miles from Lockheed, NASA Ames Research Center. So, you know, ground zeros. Lawrence Livermore Lab was 30 miles away. Moffett, Air, Moffett um, Airfield, which was where the U-2 spy planes for the West Coast would come in and land. I'd be out playing in my backyard, and I'd always know when one's coming in because there'd be this screaming sound. And you'd look up, and you'd see them, and then they'd drop down very fast, okay? Now Google rents out the Moffett Airfield for whatever it is. I think Elon Musk is actually building something in there, some strange airship. Yeah, he's, he's to go with his car that he set up in space. Yeah, well, that's just cool. <laughs> I mean, okay, so you've got all this stuff. So Harry's reading all this, and we see the letter from Dumbledore, Okay. So, Dumbledore shows up. Notice, does Harry warn the Dursleys? Why not? You mean, I think you really going to come or doubt it a little bit. Okay. So, he does show up and says, around page 44 or so, Judging by your look of stunned disbelief, Harry did not warn you that I was coming. However, let us assume that you have invited me warmly, and he steps inside and closes the door. <laughs> Right? It is a long time since my last visit. Visit? Did he really visit last time he was there? How many years ago? How old is Harry? He's going to turn 16 in this book, so it was 15 years ago. Okay. So he comes in. Notice Vernon's got a vein pulsing on his temple. He's about to blow. And Harry comes down and Dumbledore says, excellent. Vernon, I don't mean to be rude. Yet, sadly, accidental rudeness occurs alarmingly often. Now, Rowling is doing more, I think at least, of her teaching there. Why? Because look at how he finishes his sentence. Best to say nothing at all, my dear man. In other words, anything that comes out of your mouth will be rude. Just zip it up. Okay, so Petunia comes in, Dumbledore introduces himself, we have corresponded, of course. Okay, what more? until we find out in book seven, the correspondence has gone two ways. I can give this away. Petunia begged to go to Hogwarts. We find out. When... Um, Lily, thank you. Man, when Lily got her letter, Petunia wanted to go. And so Petunia wrote, and Dumbledore wrote her back. And he wrote, she wrote, and he wrote her. So that when she gets the letter with Harry's body, still breathing, and a handwritten letter, she knows whose handwriting that is before she even has to see 
Albus Dumbledore signed at the bottom. All right. So there's Dudley, and he comes in. He sits down on the couch. He has them sit down on the couch. He pours drinks for them. All right. He um, talks about Harry's gold. I'm skipping a bunch. And pours drinks for them, and their drinks keep kind of gently banging them on the side of the head. This is around page 48 or 49. And Vernon says, well, you get these ready things off us. Dumbledore, oh, I'm sorry. It would have been better manners to drink it, you know. Again, we see this beginning of this idea of teaching the Dursley's manners begin much earlier. Yeah, you could say maybe book one, but definitely book four, when Arthur, you know. Well, when Hagrid came and stuff, I'm pretty sure he just talked to Well, he gives Harry a birthday cake. I don't remember him actually oh, and then, talking about manners, per se. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he scolds them for not for, like, lying truth. about. Well, yeah, for not telling Harry about the letter. Really. He said, you know. He codswap, you know, he didn't know he would have to be the one to tell Harry about Voldemort and everything that happened to his parents. So, drinks disappear, and he calls forth Creature. Because they've had the reading of the will, and has to determine whether or not Creature now belongs to Harry. Right? So... He gets there, and Creature, whoa, 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 whoa. This is, I don't know, 50, 51, 52. And so Dumbledore says, Harry, give him an order. Harry gives him an order. He follows him. So now he knows. So now not only does Harry have a pile of gold in his vault at Gringotts, he's got a big old, what's really the only word you can use to describe number 12 Gringotts? Uh, number 12, um, Grimmauld Place. It's a mansion. It is a big, huge mansion. Okay, it might be a mansion part of a row house, but it's a mansion. It's got multiple floors, many rooms. Okay, it's huge. Compared to number four, Privet Drive, which has three bedrooms, Petunia and Vernon's, Dudley's. Do they have a guest room? No, because that was Dudley's second. Yeah, it was, was the Dudley's spare room. They have a guest room where March stays, and then they have Dudley's and Dudley's second room. Well, see, that's the question I've always had, because we're never told where March stayed. If March stayed in the room that Harry takes, and Harry has to, while she's there, it's sleep like elsewhere. The that that's there's four bedrooms? Yeah. Okay. I don't have the first book with me, yeah. but... Because if you if you visit the set, the set doesn't have four. The set has well, yeah, three. It only shows you one bedroom. It, it only shows you Harry's bedroom in the, whole, the movie. Anyway. But if I remember correctly, it's got three. I mean, because they've well, got the actual because the house isn't that isn't that big. Not much bigger than this place, in fact. In fact, in one of the rooms, you go in and they've got the the, the, Dursley's, um, house. the Dursley's house had four bedrooms. One for Uncle Vernon. It's cool. I'll teach. One for visitors. And then Dudley's. Dudley's spare room and then Dudley's. Okay. So, Dudley's there and says, doubtful I would show up. And Harry's like, yeah, yeah, kind of. So, he sends Creature off. And Vernon explains to them, Harry comes of age in a year. And they're like, no, he doesn't. 18. No, not in the wizarding world. Um, Petunia says that, I think. Dumbledore says, Wizarding World, at 17. So, he then says, uh, 53 or 54, As you already know, the wizard called Lord Voldemort has returned to this country. The wizarding community is currently in a state of open warfare. Harry, whom Lord Voldemort has already attempted to kill on a number of occasions, is in even greater danger now than the day when I left him upon your doorstep 15 years ago. With a letter explaining about his parents' murder, expressing the hope you would care for him as though he were your own. 
Dumbledore pauses. Why? Let all that sink in. Just let it all sink in. He's back. There's chaos. You did not do as I asked. You have never treated Harry as a son. Notice, the implication is, that's what he asks them to do. Treat him as you would treat your own son. It's the implication. We're never told what he says in the letter, are we? We don't see the letter. He has known nothing but neglect and often cruelty at your hands. The best that can be said is that he has at least escaped the appalling damage you have inflicted upon the unfortunate boy sitting between you. That's kind of like a thump right between the eyes. Because how do they understand that? They don't. What do you mean? What appalling damage? They look at Dudley and what do they think? Perfect little boy. Likes to beat up, you know, 10 year olds and such. Okay? So what's the appalling damage? The fact that he's a simple, he's the, the terrible the person. He's not obese anymore. Family values. Yeah. Okay. I'm assuming he developed his somewhat sense of arrogance when he got to Hogwarts, because obviously... He would have no reason to think that he's the stuff. Who, who developed a sense of arrogance? Harry. Does Harry ever show arrogance? Yeah, the fact he thinks he can save everybody. That's not arrogance. Is that arrogance? He wants to save everyone. It's not, oh, well, I know Even that I can. It's like I have to try. You at know? the end, when he told Hermione that he didn't basically need them to go on the journey with them, he was basically going to handle it himself. Okay, we'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah, we'll talk about that when we when we get to it. And it's not even necessarily that he thinks he has to. When he stops Malfoy, first book, he doesn't think. It's instinct. Fourth book, when he pulls Ron and Hermione down, he's not thinking. That's just instinct. It's instinct for Harry to defend others. When he asks Luna, "Can I help you?" Is he really thinking all that through? I don't think he is. I think it's just he sees somebody suffering and he responds. Why? He suffered. And nobody responded. That's the hold on a second. Uh, that's that's the importance of that scene when Snape sees in Harry's mind and he sees Harry being chased by Ripper, when he sees Harry, you know, bursting with envy because Dudley's got the red bicycle and stuff. When he sees Harry being laughed at, when he sees Harry being abused, the importance of that is Snape sees what? Harry is not the pampered, favored child that he thinks Harry is. So if all that was inherently in Harry the whole time, though, why was there even a debate between Slytherin and Gryffindor with the, with the hat? Well, it's partially because of the Horcrux, but it's also, no, it's partially there. We don't know what those are yet. Well, we're going to find out real quickly. Um, but it's also, notice the debate isn't in Harry. Well, yeah, <laughs> the debate's in the hat. It's not in Harry. The hat says, hmm, I'm not sure which to put you in. Okay. Because there's that element of Slytherin in the hat that says, desire to prove yourself. Well, what is that? It's a long way of saying ambition. Mm -hmm. Slytherins, that's ambition. Why does Harry have a thirst to prove himself? Did he have that thirst to prove himself when he was nine, eight, seven? No. He only has that thirst to prove himself when the boy what? Who lived. The boy who lived. When Hagrid tells him, "Golly gee, Harry, you're the first person to ever have one of these killing curses and live." Okay. And then he goes off to Gringotts. Uh, excuse me. He goes off to Diagon Alley, and he's told what by the crazy old wand maker. 
We must expect, not should, we must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. Terrible things, but great. <laughs> and he's like, gee, thanks, just put more weight, you know, on my shoulders. It's because... To, to tuple, couple with that, going back to Hitler, Hitler did great things. Now, they might have been horrible, sure he but he was able to unite on a whole country. Well, he lifted his people out of the Depression long before any of the other Western powers did. How did he do it? Put everybody to work. You put everybody to work, you know, building planes, trains, automobiles, Volkswagens, you know. That stops the depression pretty much dead in its tracks. Okay? Roosevelt tried, but he didn't try the right way. And I'm not saying Roosevelt should have gone all fascist. <laughs> We're not saying Hitler's the right way to do things, but but it worked to end his depression. He didn't end, you know, their monetary depression by starting concentration camps and all that kind of stuff. It was by creating jobs. Ideally, so, communism would be perfect. If in a perfect world. If in a perfect world. The problem is everywhere it's been tried, it sucks horribly. Better on paper. Yeah. If you removed the human element, copy this yes. would be perfect. Yeah, but it's like, you know, when in, in 2001, when, when George Bush, uh, when W, addressed Congress after 9-11, he addressed Congress nine days later, September 20th, and he said there, speech was, was regarded widely as one of the greatest speeches that American president ever given, you know, by the guy who's supposed to be a bumbling idiot. Gives a speech, and there's one thing in there that has always stuck in my mind, because it was an absolutely idiotic, asinine thing to say. We're going to have this war on terror, and we will not rest until terror is ended. Well, how do you end terror? You make it so terrifying that nobody wants to do it. Nope. You can't. You can't, actually. It takes a lot of work, an awful lot of effort, and I have to be the only one left alive. Why? Because human nature is... Well, it's self-preservation, but it's also, you see it, you put two two-year-olds into a crib with one toy. You think they're going to share? They don't. Right, 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 you know. The only way you end terror, like Bush was describing, is when one person is left. That's it. Because then everything is theirs. That's the only way communism actually works. The only way you can get the dictatorship of the proletariat is when the proletariat is all there is. But even the proletariat, these two proles might not agree. So one has got to bash the other's head in with a rock or stomp on his face with a boot. That's it. Okay? Otherwise, no go. Okay? So he says this comment about the appalling boy between you. Why is Dudley so appalling? Well, he likes to beat up people who are weaker than him. Who does that sound like? Death Eaters. Is Dudley a Death Eater? No. How do you know? Because Siri said the world is not divided between good people and Death Eaters. It's what? Good people, less good people, less, less good people, and you get down to not so good people, not good people, worse people, worser people. It's death eaters are way down here. Okay. The mass of Germans during World War II were not Hitler supporters. They were people living their lives, doing their work, supporting the fatherland, so to speak. And what did they do? They let bad things happen. Why? Because they didn't affect them. Quote that's been attributed to a British philosopher, political philosopher named Edmund Burke states, um, all that is necessary for evil to thrive is for good, yeah, I'm going to be sexist, men to do 
No. That's it. It doesn't mean bad people have to run everything. It just means good people what? If it doesn't affect me, if it doesn't affect my wallet, if it doesn't affect my life, and it doesn't affect my job, I'm not going to do anything. Where do you see that? Everywhere. Everywhere. You see it when somebody doesn't take a stand when they see something wrong happening. Any kind of injustice. Doesn't matter what that injustice is. Okay? It's not my problem. Well, eventually, it becomes your problem. Harry was born seemingly to solve this problem. He's the chosen one. Chosen by whom? By God? No. By the prophecy? No. He's chosen by Voldemort. Dumbledore is going to talk in this book about tyrants and dictators. Why do they fear the one person who speaks up? Because then, they because then somebody else speaks up next to that person. So, what do they do? They silence those who speak up. It's, that's, that's the reason why I am a free speech absolutist. I detest anybody who says, you shouldn't be allowed to say what you think, feel, believe, etc., etc especially on university campuses. We're going to have a, a person here, I don't know when it is, because I keep deleting the emails because I get angry every time I see it. <laughs> We're going to have a person here speak from the Southern Poverty Law Center. And the Southern Poverty Law Center is being held up as this great civil rights organization. It's not. It might have been at one point, but the Southern Poverty Law Center today labels as people who speak hate speech Two of the preeminent feminist scholars of our world, Christina Hoff Summers and Ayan Hirsi Ali. Didn't this trend start with UC Berkeley? No, UC Berkeley actually began in the 1960s and 1964 with the free speech movement, saying we need more free speech, and now UC Berkeley is one of the places shutting speech down and saying you can't say what you want. You can't say what you think. Okay? A student in a, in a university in Pennsylvania, just the other day, completely off the topic, just the other day, it was reported, a student in a religious studies class, and the studies, religious studies class is something like self-sin and salvation. That's the title of the course. Okay? The, the, the um, course had a speaker come in, a transgender speaker, and then the student, finished, after the transgender person spoke, the professor said, okay, I only, want, I only want women to speak. I only want women to tell me what they thought about X, Y, Z, what this person said. And it was silent. Nobody said anything. And the student in this report I read said, you know, after about 30 seconds or a minute, thought, it was a male, thought, nobody else is saying anything, so I'm going to, you know, give my two cents worth. Why? It's a college classroom and it's been open for discussion. And he said, biologists tell us there are only two genders. That's what biology teaches. XY chromosomes, you know. It's, that's it. And the teacher immediately shut him down, wrote him up, okay, and he's now being threatened. He's supposed to graduate in May. He needs this course. That he won't be able to complete the course unless he submits a written apology to the class and orally apologizes to the class and then sits there while the professor says, okay, now each of you tell us what you think about what so-and-so said and how it made you feel. And have any of you read 1984? Yes. What is that? That is the two minutes hate. That is where that student then gets singled out. Okay? That is a due process violation right there. 14th Amendment. He could go to the Supreme Court and he would win that case. Okay? Because now everything in that class is what? Focusing solely on him. Whereas he was making 
whether you agree with it or not, a philosophical argument. This is where that's supposed to happen. Okay? And yet it's not. Whether they view well, yeah. There's a, there's a, another case. A professor in, in Canada records his classes, like I do. Okay, and he made some comments. Some people took offense with them. His dean has told him, take the videos down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He's like, no. Well, but what happens in that classroom? He's been told is confidential. And people have said. Whoa, this is a public university. Since when is what happens in a classroom confidential? Students' grades, confidential. Yes. If one of you were a friend of my family and my wife, as I've had students before, and my wife said, how's so-and-so doing? I can't answer that. It's confidential. Can't say anything about it. I'd say, go, go talk to so-and-so yourself, you know, kind of a thing. Okay. Yeah, get a consent form, you know, kind of a thing. Okay, so Harry hasn't suffered that appalling damage. Why? Book four, why can Harry push off the imperious curse? Strength of character. What do you need to build strength of character? This is what the Dursleys, unbeknownst to them, have done properly for Harry. They pampered Dudley. They've pampered Dudley, and Harry has had to overcome adversity seemingly from day one. He's had to confront adversity. Okay? He hasn't lived a pampered life. No, I shouldn't. I shouldn't go here. Oh, but what the hell? It's all on YouTube. Safe zones. Safe zones. College campuses. This this is, in some universities, this is a safe zone. This is where you should be able to come and feel safe. Not feel challenged. Not have your ideas believed in. And I'm like, okay, and I've told you, I'm a... Then don't go to college. Right? Conservative, Christian, like all that kind of stuff. One of my closest, quote-unquote, friends in the department, atheist Marxist, because he and I get along very well when we talk about this stuff. Okay? Why go to college? Because you're there to be coddled. Some students are. Because they are to have their thinking what? Affirmed. Confirmed and affirmed. They're supposed to be challenged. That's the idea of, you know. You don't learn that way. Thank you. <laughs> Instead, they want a new horizon. Participation trophies. Yeah, I know. I've, yeah, I know. Okay. Harry doesn't get any of that. He gets the exact opposite, which is why he has the scars to show for it, both the literal one, okay, and the mental ones. So, Vernon goes on and says, this magic will cease, however, when turns, Harry turns to all I ask, let him come back one more time. Notice, he won't come back for Christmas. He won't come back for Easter. Just let him come back one more time before his 17th birthday. That, that gives him another year to what? Work on his defenses, to learn, you know, all that kind of stuff. Okay? So, they leave, and we're told at the end of that chapter, the last page, none of the Dursleys said anything. Dudley was frowning slightly, still trying to figure out how he'd been mistreated. <laughs> like that's all you <laughs> Uncle Vernon looked as though he had something stuck in his throat. Well, he had been told to shut up. <laughs> Never know if maybe there was a little nonverbal, you know, and he couldn't say anything. Aunt Petunia, however, was oddly flushed. Okay, flushed implies what? Her face is red. Why? Embarrassed. embarrassed? You become embarrassed because of what? Shame. She is feeling shame. And notice, oddly. This is not a usual occurrence with her. Not much shames her. She's the only one 
Maybe Vernon does, and he just, you know, he doesn't have a retort. Right? Or maybe she has gotten it. It's just the first time someone said it out loud to her. Well, possible, but I think it begins earlier. Especially since it's a jumbled word that's saying that, because she's had an affirmation from him for so long, because to her, he represents the magic of the world, because he was the one that excluded her from it. Remember my last, Petunia. It's the howler that comes at the end of the previous book, excuse me, at the beginning of the previous book, that she says he's got to stay. Well, what's the my last? Is it the letter on the doorstep with Harry? Probably. Could it be something else? Possibly, but I don't think so. Are there probable letters before that? Yeah, I think so. Okay. You jump to book seven, and you see something really similar. Harry's getting ready to leave. It's his 17th birthday. The Dursleys are leaving so that Harry can leave number Privet Drive with the Dursleys all safe. And what do we see happen? Vernon just wants to get the hell out of there after it's made really clear. If you stick around, Voldemort's going to try and kill you. Okay, it's... Then who stops him? Dudley does. Okay. We'll talk about it when we get there. So, Dudley goes out, Vernon goes out, Aunt Petunia is the last one to leave. She turns around. She looks at Harry. She acts like she's going to start to say something, and we're told something like her mouth quivers, and then she leaves. Why doesn't she actually say anything? Have you ever been in a situation where there is so much emotion where if you open your mouth, you're not sure what's going to come out. And so you just kind of bite your tongue to keep... I think that's what's happening. I think at that point in book seven, because Dudley has already... I don't want to put it. Transformed. We saw Dudley demented at the beginning of book seven. Book seven, we see Dudley minted. Dudley mentored, Dudley in his proper mind, when he says to Harry, I don't think you're a waste of space. And Harry tells us what that means. What does it mean? Coming from Dudley, that's like saying, I love you. That's how Harry takes it to mean. So for Harry, I don't think you're a waste of space is translated. I love you. And how does Harry reply? See ya. Big D. Big D. Why does he call him Big D? He's part of his gang. He's part of his gang. What has just happened in that scene, which is not, was not in the theatrical release. Maybe it is on the extended version DVD. I don't know. I haven't seen him. And it actually begins even before then. It begins that morning when Harry goes outside his room and there's a teacup with tea in it and he steps on it and breaks it. And he thinks it's a practical joke. And he thinks maybe it's not. Maybe it's a peace offering by Dudley. See, I think between here and there, Dudley's working out the appalling damage. Literally working out. He's getting it out of him. So that when Harry says, Blimey, Dudley, did that Dementor breathe a new soul into you? It's what? It's Dudley reborn. Because we're going to get all kinds of conversion language, especially in that book. Okay? Not Dudley Jesified. Not Dudley becomes a Christian. Dudley becomes... In another sense, a real person. A person who looks at others as equal or maybe even before himself. At least Harry. Okay? So, we're going to skip most of Slughorn. We get more lessons. Harry says, why don't we just apparate right into his house? Anybody know D um, Dumbledore's response? 
It's courtesy, Harry. Courtesy says we knock on the door and then we go in. <laughs> Yeah, and some of the houses are booby trapped, you know, and you don't want to. Okay, so they go in, and what does Harry notice about Dumbledore when they leave the Dursleys before they arrive at Slughorns? His hand. What's wrong with it? It's black, and the skin's been burned. And he asks them about it. And he says, "I'll tell you, you know, when I can give you the proper, you know, telling, etc." So they talk Slughorn into coming. And just before, it's after they arrive at the borough, page 77 or so, 76, 77, um, Harry tells Dumbledore, while I was at the Dursleys, I realized I can't shut myself away or crack up. Sirius wouldn't have wanted that, would he? Because Dumbledore's mentioned Sirius. Anyway, life's too short. Look at Madame Bones. Look at Emily Vance. What does he mean, life's too short? Did they know what was coming? No. I mean, what did the false mad eye Moody try to teach them? The Dark Wizard's not going to what? Or give you a warning. A warning. He's going to do this. <laughs> Boom. To your back. He had no idea what I was doing there until I went, you know. <laughs> That's what a dark wizard slash terrorist is going to do. He's not going to go, oh, pardon me, old good man. Let me turn around and face me. Yes, yes, right, right, you know. All right, I'm just going to place this bomb right here. Yeah. With a warning sign, you know, warning bomb. You know. It could be me next, couldn't it? Yes, Harry, it could be you next. Guess what? That's the point of all seven books. That's it. Right there, in a nutshell. Everyone must be prepared to die. The books are about, a little bit more than that, I think, how to die well. How to die well. How to have a good death. How do we know that it's that and not just how to die? Okay. Bingo. Because nearly headless Nick did not die well. The bloody Baron did not die well. Rowena Ravenclaw did not die well. The fat monk did not die well. To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. So it's having the well-organized mind win. Before you suck that last bit of air. Okay? Jump ahead for a moment. I'm going to give one person dies. I'm going to give away. A lot of people die, but I'm going to give this one away. You're probably already familiar with it. It's, it's, it's Snape's death. Snape has a good death. Okay? Partially. Partially. But there's another character who has a... <laughs> don't name don't name this one. There's another character who dies who you're unexpected. It comes unexpectedly. And probably some of you when we get to that might have tears in your eyes when we talk about that passage. Because it happens. It happens every semester. Okay. And it's not pig widget. <laughs> but she is preparing her readers for this. And I think it's partially because Rowling was unprepared for her mother's death. When she was, anybody know, 22, 25? She was really young. Her mom was only in her early 40s when she died of cancer. No, Rowling wasn't. She was in her, yeah, she was in her early 20s. She had already, I'm pretty sure she was, um, Pregnant, she was either pregnant or already had her eldest child, and her mom died. Before, before she gets the books, she had started writing the first one. Okay. It's kind of like she didn't get to say what needed to be said or done, and I think this is her 
working all that out. This is her way of saying, you know what, folks? You never know when it's going to come. I mean, look at those 17 kids in Parkland. Look at the 32 students in, you know, Virginia Tech in 2007. They didn't know that that morning was going to be their last day. Look at the over 3,000 people in 9-11. They didn't know that was going to be their last day. Okay. Or any event. The homeless person who doesn't wake up in the morning under the bridge. Or anybody who takes their last breath. Most of us have no idea when it's coming. Okay. She is saying, Dumbledore says... If you are prepared, well, how does that preparation come? Harry's going to tell us here. He and Dumbledore are going to have a long talk about the prophecy. Because what does he still think the prophecy means? Some great power on high has determined it's about Voldemort and me. And Dumbledore is like, Harry, you damn fool, listen to me. It's only about you because he made it about you. It could have been Harry Potter and Xenophilius Lovegood if he had gone after Xenophilius Lovegood. In which case it would be Xenophilius Lovegood and the Half-Blood Prince. It's quite a mouthful. Okay? Be very interesting, wouldn't it? Okay. So, he then tells Harry, or Harry goes on. It could be Memex, couldn't it? But if it is, he said fiercely, now looking straight into Dumbledore's Blue eyes, gleaming in the one light. Oh, I'll make sure I take as many Death Eaters with me as I can. Voldemort, too, if I can manage it. You know, it's kind of like, and it's a little dog, too. Yeah. <laughs> Why does he say this? What is saying this in Harry? He's not afraid to die. Okay, he's not afraid to die. What else? He's ready to do it for the right cause. He's ready to do it for what else? When I said, what in Harry is saying this? The Gryffindor letter. The Gryffindor, what else? Okay, what else? This is anger. This is anger speaking. This is hatred speaking. And yet, when it comes down to it, Harry can't kill. He can't kill. He never kills. What are we told, the pro what does the prophecy say about the person who will have power to defeat the Dark Lord? It doesn't, it doesn't only say he will have power to defeat the Dark Lord. How power the Dark Lord knows not, which Dumbledore has already said is what? Love. Oh, should I just have to hug him to death? <laughs> so when he was chasing Bellatrix, Bellatrix through the little outside the Weasley house, what was his plan for if he got to her? Like, was he going to... He didn't kill her. He tried to... I know, that's what I'm saying. Since he can't... He had two chances. He's had two chances to kill her. And because after she killed well, Sirius, he... Yeah, the Ministry of Magic. Okay, hold on with that. So, he'll have power the Dark Lord knows not. That's love. And what else? Neither can he live long. Nope. He'll have something else. Uncommon skill. Uncommon skill, power the Dark Lord knows not. What is Harry's uncommon skill? No, it's not which. No, because that's not skill. No, it's not luck. What does Harry do better than anybody else? Close. Do, actively. How? What does he use to defend himself? Expelliarmus. He disarms people. Think about that for a moment. Think about that literally for a moment. He disarms people. If he disarms them, okay, what can they not do? They can't harm anyone else. Who else can they not harm themselves? No. We find out in book seven. What happens when you kill someone? Your you soul. split your soul. Doesn't mean you have to turn it into a horcrux. You split your soul. 
So when you kill somebody else, what are you really doing? You're killing yourself. A little bit. Huh? Yourself. I mean, the, the, not the body, the part that inhabits the body. Okay? So if you disarm someone, what are you actually doing to that person? Saving them. You are saving them. You are keeping that individual from killing him or herself. There's a branch of, of martial arts. I, every time I say Taekwondo. this, I remember. No, it's not Taekwondo. No, I know. I had a, a student, a godson of mine, who used to pra who practiced it. And, you know, we were talking about Aikido. this in class one day. Yeah, it's Aikido. And he was like, that, that's Aikido. Okay? Where the goal is to disarm your opponent so that your opponent doesn't harm himself by using his strength against you. That's what Harry does with Expelliarmus. Every time. Book seven. Who's going to jump on his case really bad about using Expelliarmus? Lupin. Harry, you used it. It's your signature move. Harry, you know, I'm not going to use something else. If I had used the Stunning Charm, he says, on... Um, Bus, driver, not Ernie. Stan. If I'd used a stunning on Stan Shunpike, who was several hundred feet in the air on a broom, what would have happened to him? Fallen He'd have died. fallen off and died. I might as well have used a vodka Kedavra. I'm not going to kill. Okay? His other, if, if you want, the flip side of that in common skill, may be that he can't kill. In fact, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I won't talk about yeah, this. I've got to wait. <laughs> so, I'll take as many Death Eaters as I can. And what does Dumbledore say? Way to go, Harry. Spoken like Sirius' true godson in James. Yeah, you will go down fighting. How well did James go down fighting? His wand was on the couch. His wand was on the couch. So how did he fight Voldemort? Give him the old one-two. <laughs> Voldemort comes in... Pss, that's what it was, Bzz, like a bug to a, you know, bug zapper. At least a lily, I mean, James didn't even go up to the stairway. No, not my son, not my wife, you know. Just bzz. At least lily got in front of Harry and tried. He couldn't do anything. James couldn't do anything without that, okay? So, Dumbledore then goes on and says to Harry what? Did not get as far as I needed to. You need your friends, Harry. Tell Ron and Hermione. Tell them what? Everything. Tell them everything. Tell them about the prophecy. They've been battle tested. They, they have been battle tested. But what else is he suggesting there? You might not be around now. Okay. True. You can't do this alone. You can't do this alone. You're going to see when we get to the Lord of the Rings. I know, you don't think we're ever going to get to the Lord of the Rings. We will. When we get to the Frodo can't do it by himself. That's the point. Yeah, it's the point of both of these. No one person can do it all on their own. We all have to have others. And you could go all, you know, Jungian psychology and go, that's kids, we all have the others inside of us. And <laughs> <laughs> the good and the bad. And I've got Ron and me and Hermione and me, and I've got to listen to the Hermione part. Right? Does Harry listen to the Hermione part enough? No. A little bit more, maybe. He listens to the Ron part a bit too much. Okay. To Hag Hagrid part. <laughs> The Dumbledore part, not as much, but he does at the end of book seven. Very end of book, not the stupid epilogue. Just pull that part out. The end, the final battle. Okay? So, excess of phlegm. <coughs> it's gone. We can get over that. Harry gets his owls, page 102. How'd he do? Well, as Ron did. Okay, so we get the grades, 
Outstanding, exceeds expectations, acceptable, poor, dreadful, troll. I used to joke with my kids, you know, because it's all trolls. Um, so, astronomy, A, care of magical creatures, it's Hagrid, E, exceeds expectations, charms, E, defense against the dark arts, outstanding, why do you think you got that? He's been doing it all the time. <laughs> okay, is it because of what happened at the Ministry of Magic? Possibly, in other words, they let subsequent events kind of influence the grading. But it could also be he did the Patronus. You know, little Professor Tofty or whatever his name was said, Oh, can you see me? And he goes, Yeah. And he looks at Umbridge and yeah. nails her, you know, so to speak, with it. He, Tofty whittles himself. Divination, poor. Why? He always falls asleep. It's a useless class. He doesn't like. Uh, well, yeah, Trelawney or she, her only two, what two things that she. But she doesn't teach. finish teaching it. Friends does. Yeah. Hmm. Herbology exceeds expectations. History, magic. He fell asleep in potions. Why is that important? Because he wants to be an orb. Okay. Why else is it important? What are Snape's expectations of Harry? Do you think they're up here? Yeah, I don't think they're. I don't think they're very high. I think you know Harry puts his name on his thing, and by it exceeds. <laughs> okay, Transfiguration exceeds expectations. Okay, Draco's detour. So we see Draco going to. Um, Bergen and Bo Bergen and Bergs, which we're going to skip. Slug Club, I'm going to skip most of. What is the Slug Club? Slughorn's favorite that he's collecting. Why is he collecting them? Because they're going to go on to do great things. things. They're either connected to greatness or they will go on to be great. And he's networking. Yeah. He knows how in the future he can reach out. And, right. Great Quidditch. So Who are some people in this? Who are some unexpected people in this group? No, 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 no. Students. Ginny? Who else? McClagan. Luna? Who else? Yeah, I don't think Luna's in it. She's invited by Harry to the Christmas thing, but she's not part of it. Thank you. Neville. Neville's in it. Neville! And Draco is not. So why is Neville in it? Because he was with us. Because haven't you seen Neville at this point in the films? He goes from being fat, stupid, ugly little Neville to whoa. <laughs> okay. Okay. See, that's because <laughs> he's actually serving at the, the Christmas holiday. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Oh, poor Neville. So, Snape victorious. What happens to Harry just at the end of the trip on the Hogwarts Express? Okay, notice the verb tense. He gets petrified. That's passive voice. Make it active. How does he get petrified? Draco petrifies him. How? He sees him spotted up. He sees the invisibility cloak move. He spots Harry. He lets him there. For the remainder of the train ride, okay, while well, Harry's under the cloak, and then he hits him with the Petrificus Totalis. But Harry's got the cloak on him. I thought the cloak repelled spells. Or does it only repel conceal anti concealment spells, revealing spells? I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Come on, Mikey, you should know this. I know this. <laughs> it's not the cloak's power I don't trust. It's her consistency in talking exactly. about the cloak yeah. is what I have a problem with. Anyways, and what does Draco do when Harry falls on the ground? It's an image I used earlier in class. His face. Stomps on his face. Okay. 
That is a fascistic image. It is a line straight out of Brave New World. You want an image of the future? The image is of a boot stomping on a face. Winston Smith is told. Okay? That's what Draco does. And Harry ends up saving his life. <laughs> Tonks rescues him, takes him up. Snape victorious. Right. Snape is victorious. Hold on. Snape is victorious in two ways, right? What's the obvious way in that chapter? He's finally teaching defense against the dark arts. After 15 years, and every year, he applies for it. But bear in mind, every year, since the year before Harry was born, new defense against the dark arts. So when Hagrid says, you know, it's been cursed. Yeah, the job's been cursed. Okay? What's the other way Snape is victorious? He's cleaned up, at least. But he gets to take points away from Harry before the term actually even begins. Notice Harry doesn't try what he tried with McGonagall at the beginning of book two. Yeah, it's not going to happen. So Harry's pretty angry and such. Um, let's see here. Um, go to how much time do we have? We will. Yeah, we'll um. Well, Half-Blood Prince, around 179, 180, McGonagall's going over Neville's schedule with him. What's Neville want to do? Uh, transfiguration. What does he want to be? He's kind of leaning towards an Ors. He wants to take the coursework that was required for an or. And she's like, no, you're not good enough in Transfiguration. She says, take Herbology. Sprout says, you know, you did well there. This is, um, what page did I say? This is, um, not 178, 178, 173 or so. Okay. He holds his head down because, you know, he's not good enough in Transfiguration. And he says, you know, my grandmother wants me in it. It's high time your grandmother learned to be proud of the grandson she's got rather than the one she thinks she ought to have, particularly after what happened at the ministry. Now, that's pretty high praise. Neville turns pink. I'm sorry, Longbottom. I cannot let you into my new class, blah, blah, blah. My grandmother thinks charms is a soft option. Here's an example of what McGonagall does, what I said I can't do. Even though her grandmother's long, his grandmother's long gone from Hogwarts. I shall drop Augusta a line. First of all, she names her by name, first name basis. Okay. How long has she been teaching? Previous book, 49 years. 50 years. More than likely, Neville's grandmother was a student of hers. Okay. I'll drop Augusta line reminding her that just because she failed her charms owl, the subject is not necessarily worthless. She failed her charms owl. How did Neville do? Uh, defense against the dark arts exceed expectations. Let's see here. Why not try for a new? I see that you have an exceeds expectations. Grandma failed. Grandma's a loser. <laughs> Neville, you're an ace. Okay. Does Neville need much confidence building at this point? Can't hurt, but he was one of six students who went off to the Ministry of Magic and held off the not Dementors, the Death Eaters, until what? Quite a while, until the Order arrived. Really, until who arrived? Dumbledore. Dumbledore. I mean, because... You know, Lupin's fighting, Sirius is fighting, and they're not winning yet. 
It takes Dumbledore's coming for the order to win. Okay. Um, let's see here. Yeah, we can skip that. Okay, so we'll stop there, and we'll probably pick up on Thursday with Chapter 10, The House of Gaunt. I'll say a couple comments about the Half-Blood Prince chapter. So, since you all are just dying to have a quiz, 